Thank you, and also thanks to the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to, to speak. Um, so, of course, the theory of quantum groups and its applications needs no introduction, but maybe the theory of quantum symmetric pairs does. Uh, so for now, you can think a quantum symmetric pair is like a quantum subgroup, and in the past decade, it's become clear that uh, these quantum subgroups um, have analogs of all the things you know and love about, uh, about quantum group theory. Uh, they appear in categorification, they admit a canonical basis, there's a sure while dualities, and today I'd like to tell you about uh, their applications in low dimensional topology. So this is by means of equivariant factorization homology, and so before um, getting to applications, I'll uh, have to explain what all these uh, words mean. So this is more or less the, the, the setup for the talk. Um, so let's dive into it. So what is the geometric context that we're talking about? So I mentioned orbifolds, and so um, what I mean is a global quotient orbifold. So we have a, a smooth manifold, M. There's a finite group acting on it. Okay, this action is not uh, necessarily free, so this could have uh, singular points in its quotient. And then, um, so we're specifically talking about framed uh, quotients. So what does it mean for M to be framed? Well, we know what that means. It just means we've um, fix the trivialization of the tangent bundle. So now you might wonder, okay, what is, um, what is a, a framing of a global quotient? And so if you think about the orbifold um, in terms of the equivariant geometry of M, that should be an equivariant trivialization of the tangent bundle of M. So equivariant with respect to what? Um, we need to fix some representation of the group gamma such that we can trivialize the tangent bundle equivariantly with respect to that given representation. And so that's what I'll call a row-framed global quotient. Okay. Now, um, what are examples of these? So let's look at a sort of small group um, example. So we're taking Z mod 2Z, um, which I denote by Z2. Um, so for example, you might take uh, the 2 disk, you rotate by 180 degrees, that gets a fixed point at the origin. And now with the normal blackboard framing, you see that this framing is inverted by the Z2 action, so the sign representation is here the framing representation. Or similarly, you might take two disks and we have the free quotient, but we've framed them uh, with the opposite framing, so that also here we get this sign representation. And finally, you might take a torus and rotate it 180 degrees like this, so you see four fixed points appearing, um, and this again is a, a sign framed uh, orbifold surface. Okay, so these of course fit into a category of uh, framed global quotients and the type of maps that we're considering are framed embeddings, but these are framed only up to a prescribed homotopy, okay, so you don't need to preserve the framing on the nose. Um, and in fact there's a whole space of these framed embeddings, so it's rather a topological category or an infinity category if you prefer. Now to obtain invariance, we're going to think about these orbifolds that's glued out of simple pieces. And so if you think about manifolds, there's of course only one local piece that one needs, namely the, the disk Rn. But for orbifolds locally, if you're around some point, they might look very differently. And this is completely determined by the isotropy group um, once we have a, a fixed sort of representation uh, that controls the global geometry. So what are these local pieces? That's a, a full subcategory that we're going to be looking at of disks. And these disks all look as follows. We, we take some, some uh, subgroup of the finite group, um, which, is, uh, which receives a fateful action on the row. And then we, we can consider this, uh, this quotient, by which I mean we take gamma and Rn and we mod out the diagonal I action. Okay? So this is just the amount of cosets of uh, I in gamma copies of Rn, and it, it naturally has one of these row-frame structures that we talked about. And so we're going to be thinking about global quotients as glued from these, and we have a symmetric monoid structure on both these categories given by disjoint union. Okay, so now this is sort of a natural generalization of the setup of factorization homology as introduced by Ayala Francis, so we can define our invariance in the same way. Uh, namely, we fix an algebraic gadget called a disk algebra, which just means a symmetric monoidal functor from our category of disks into uh, our favorite target uh, symmetric monoidal category. And then we integrate that algebraic gadget over the orbifolds by means of a left Kahn extension uh, construction. Okay, so if you don't know what left Kahn extensions are, um, let's just not worry about the details, but let me tell you some properties of what this construction has. Okay, so first, by definition, it's a, it's a functor, so this thing is functorial, 
with respect to the framed embeddings, which were our morphisms, but also the higher morphisms like isotopies of embeddings, isotopes between isotopies and so forth. And it's, uh, it's monoidal, so taking the disjoint union of two uh, orbifolds, the invariant assigned is naturally the tensor product of the, the separate invariants. And now finally, the key property that actually allows us to make computations is uh, so-called tensor excision, meaning if we have, um, say, some, uh, some global quotient that we divide up into two pieces, so we've got a piece M plus here, which is a gamma uh, invariant piece, we have a piece M1, and they intersect over a color gluing as such, which is a product of N cross R. And what's important here is that this R um, direction is completely, receives a trivial action from gamma, okay? So gamma is not doing anything on the R direction on this thing. Now what that means for us is that the invariant assigned to this color gluing has a natural E1 structure coming from the R direction, okay? So there's an associative algebra structure on this piece of the invariant, and it's in fact acting on the invariants left and right, uh, just given by embedding that color gluing piece into either the left or the right uh, chunk of this uh, uh, cut up uh, manifold. And so we can compute the invariant as this uh, relative uh, tensor product construction. Uh, maybe important to note that this is in fact a defining property. Okay, so if, if you have some abstract functor out of this category of orbifolds in a ni in, into a nice enough uh, symmetric monoidal category and it satisfies excision, then in fact it must be given by, by uh, a factorization homology uh, construction. Okay, so that's the abstract setup, um, and in fact, we don't need to think about frames, you could do other structure groups, but now let's just move to a specific example, namely the one where these quantum symmetric pairs show up. Okay, so we're going to move to two dimensions, um, back to the Z2 group with this sign representation, and so first we need to think about what's the kind of algebraic data that we need to fix in order to get invariance. Okay, so the question is, what does it mean to, to have a symmetric monoidal functor out of this category of disks? Well, there's only two types of um, orbifold disks in this case. We have the free quotient and we have the singular quotient, okay? At least for this given representation. Now, d and d star, which are the names for these orbifolds, will get assigned something. And so we're going to be taking our uh, invariants with values in k-linear categories, okay? So that means one of these functors assigns a category A to D and a category M to D star. And the question is, what are the structures that these categories need to have in order to define one of these set to disk algebras? Okay. Um, and so the monoidal structure, I, I've made a comment there. It's kind of basically what you would imagine it to be. It's like a k-linear tensor product of k-linear categories. Okay. So just let, let's, let's just look at some embeddings and some isotopies to see what kind of structures appear. So one thing uh, you could do, well, we, we can take the free quotient and then flip <coughs> the two disks. Okay, that's an equivariant embedding from this thing to itself. And so it's a morphism in our category. So that should get assigned a functor, which goes from A to A. Um, we could also do something else. We might take two copies of this uh, D and embed it into D again, which results in a functor from the tensor product of A with itself to A, okay? And then I invite you to think of that as a tensor product functor. Uh, or we might take a copy of D and a copy of D star and embed that into a bigger copy of D star, and what results is a functor from M tensor A to M. So these are some of the embeddings, but of course there's also higher morphisms, so there's also certain isotopies we might look at. So for example, we might compose the flip embedding twice, but well, that's just the normal embedding, the identity embedding. So in particular, there's an isotopy between its composition and the identity embedding given by the trivial isotopy. And which, what results then is a natural isomorphism between the square of this functor phi and the identity functor on A. Um, otherwise, we might take this um, embedding for the tensor product, we can rotate these two disks, um, and what results is, uh, is a braiding natural isomorphism between the tensor product and the opposite tensor product. So this, of course, reminds us very much of an E2 uh, algebra. Um, and now what's interesting here is when we rotate these uh, action sort of embeddings around the, around the um, 
singular point, what we notice is that once we end this rotation, which is like a half twist, uh, the colors red and blue are interchanged, okay? Which for us was exactly that embedding corresponding to phi. So this doesn't get back to the action tensor, but actually we're twisting the A component by this functor phi. Now, of course, there's a lot more data. Um, you might draw like wild embeddings and worry what is corresponding to this. But it turns out that all the data you need can be expressed in a small finite list of functors and natural isomorphisms, um, which I've summarized here as follows. So you, well, so I've shown a coherence theorem that says if you want to have a Z2 disk algebra in this two category of categories, actually this is the data that you need. You need a braid monoidal category with an anti-involution, and you need a module category, which has what I call a Z2-cylinder braiding. Um, I'll leave the coherences out uh, at the moment, but I'll draw some pictures later so you see what kind of um, um, axioms this cylinder braiding should satisfy. Um, but then, of course, the question is, where do I get examples of such? And this is where the symmetric pairs enter. Uh, so let me remind you, so what is a symmetric pair? Well, I have some semi-simple semi Lie algebra G with an involution, a Lie algebra involution on it, and I'm looking at the sub-Lie algebra fixed points. Okay, so this is what is called a symmetric pair. I've given you some examples. And classically, these were studied as the infinitesimal data corresponding to a symmetric space. Okay, so the symmetric space here, so think of G theta as the complexified Lie algebra of K, and G is the complexified Lie algebra of G. Now, people were interested in studying quantum symmetric spaces, but they didn't know how to define those. And so a natural idea was to try and quantize this infinitesimal data, because, of course, the quantum group was well known. So then the question becomes, how does one quantize that sub Lie algebra? And interestingly, it turns out it doesn't quantize to a sub Hopf algebra of the quantum group. Rather, um, it's slightly more subtle. So what you find is you can indeed quantize these, which is done in the work of these uh, various people. Um, but the subalgebra B that quantizes U of G theta is actually a coideal subalgebra. Okay? We'll get back to the relevance of this uh, later. Now, as I promised, quantum symmetric pairs should have all the cool stuff quantum groups also have. So, what do they have that is particularly nice? Well, the quantum group, of course, has the universal R matrix, and there is an analog for quantum symmetric pairs called the universal K matrix. So what is this? Um, so this is due to Balagovic and Kolb, and they say every quantum symmetric pair is quasi-triangular, by which they mean there is a universal K matrix which solves in every B module this particular equation called the reflection equation. And so here um, I've drawn a topological picture which explains what that equation is saying, and so this is the equation corresponding to the braid group of a cylinder. And so this K, as you can see, is appearing here literally as a K in the picture, which explains its name. Um, and, uh, um, well, and so that's, that's more or less all there is to say, but there is a subtlety. So in fact, if you study what the quantum symmetric pairs solve, it's not quite this equation. Rather, it's the following equation. So there's twists appearing in this reflection equation, and this is the actual equation being solved by the quantum symmetric pairs. So here phi is some involution on the quantum group and somehow the R matrix is being twisted um, throughout this equation. So if you look at these pictures, it's not quite clear how to interpret this. And in fact, I'm, I'm proposing we should rather look at some other picture. So this was a picture of uh, the braid group of the cylinder, which we can think of as the uh, uh, fundamental group of points in a plane. But rather, I want to propose we need to look at the um, fundamental group of points in the orbifold plane, okay? So think about this D star. Then we can draw the following picture. So this is a picture of uh, the configuration space of two points in D star, this singular orbifold, where this black line is now representing the singularity. And rather than just drawing the points themselves, I've also drawn their Z2 orbit in a different color, okay? So a configuration of points in the orbifold is now a Z2 orbit of points within the uh, orbifold. And what we can see now is that, the, well, the R matrix is just a, a double R matrix happening on the, on the points and their Z2 orbits, but the K matrix is exchanging the uh, blue braid for its red Z2 orbit braid. 
And so if you think about coloring these pictures by representations in the quantum group, we would color the, the blue uh, braids with normal representations, but their uh, Z2 orbits are colored by the twisted representations by phi. And so now, if we do K2 and then we apply the R matrix, we see we need to twist one leg of the R matrix by phi, uh, and similarly there, twist this one by phi twice and here once, which is exact exactly capturing this twisted reflection equation. Okay, so this is not just some like funny way to reinterpret that equation, this is actually a profound connection between quantum symmetric pairs and, and orbifolds. Namely, let us move back to the um, observables that we discussed before. So on the one hand, we have the quantum symmetric pair with the various sort of structures that are naturally present. And on the other hand, we have the local observables for these Z2 disk algebras as we discussed before. So now if we imagine we take the quantum groups category of modules and denote it A, and we take the category of modules for the symmetric pair and denote it M, then we see that we perfectly match up um, the structures present between the local observables on the one hand and those present in a quantum symmetric pair on the other. Um, so what does that mean? That means that if we um, take the following uh, notation, that the pair RepQG and RepQK is exactly um, the type of data uh, of a Z2 disk algebra in categories. In particular, this means we obtain invariance of uh, two-dimensional orbifold surfaces by integrating uh, this Z2 disk algebra. And so the question is, what do we get? So let's go back to my favorite example of uh, an orbifold surface. We want to understand what is the uh, categorical invariant associated to, to this orbifold. Or rather, maybe let's not do this orbifold, but the one I actually computed. Namely, we remove two points on the end and there, so we're only left with two fixed points, and think about this orbifold quotient. Okay, so we are puncturing the torus twice and considering the orbifold like so. Now, what is the neat thing? Now I can take two copies of D, which was this free quotient here and there, and I can embed them together with this punctured torus into itself just by drawing back that torus a bit. Okay, well, by functoriality, if I have an embedding as such on the assigned invariance, I get a functor as such, where D is now my shorthand for this uh, invariant that we are trying to understand. So what does this mean that we have a functor as such? Well, D is appearing as a module category. Now, module categories, if you're lucky, are much easier to understand because there's a lot of structure present. In fact, we'll make use of the following slogan, module categories should be categories of modules. Okay, so we are supposed to understand what is the algebra object for which this um, category is appearing as a category of modules? Now, rather than running you through the computation, um, let me rather just explain to you what that algebra is and where it appears. Okay, so the particular al algebra that we're interested in is the algebra of quantum differential operators. So let me recall what that actually means. So think about differential operators on a group G. What should that be? Well, we have functions on the group, we have sort of this enveloping algebra of vector fields on our group, and there's a cross-relation because if you want to move the vector fields past functions, they're going to take a derivative. Okay, so you could write that as a certain specific uh, cross-tensor product of UG and OG, which is actually a very general Hopf algebra construction known as the Heisenberg uh, algebra. In particular, this just generalizes to the quantum setting by replacing UG by UQG and OG by OQG, the, the dual quantum group. Okay, so that's what I mean by this algebra of quantum differential operators. Now, this isn't just an algebra in vector spaces, rather it appears naturally inside a certain category. So the group G has a natural right action on itself and a natural left action, and so this Algebra of quantum differential operators is equivariantly quantizing the, the differential operators with these two actions. Okay, so where should this DQG live? It naturally lives in RepQG tensor RepQG, which is encoding this left and right uh, action that is naturally present. Well, if DQG is an algebra object in there, then in particular we can look at the category of modules for this algebra object internal to RepQG tensor RepQG. 
Now this allows us to formulate our results. Namely, if you want to compute the categorical invariant of this punctured torus, we get the category of modules for dqg, but not in repqg tends to repqg, rather in repqk tends to repqk. Now recall, repqg acts on repqk. In particular, if you have an algebra object inside repqg, it makes sense to look at modules for that algebra object inside repqk. So in particular, or similarly, if you have an algebra object in the tensor product of repqg tends to repqg, then this uh, expression makes sense as well. But so if we try to sort of unwrap what does that mean, well, we're looking at modules of this algebra dqg, which are equivariant for a left and right k action. So those are k cross k equivariant d modules on the group G. Or if you like, those are exactly the quantum d modules on this uh, double quotient k mod g mod k. Okay, so this is the, the main result. Um, let me maybe say something more because I see I still have some time left. Um, so this is interesting and it's quite nice. Now what can you do with this? So this is some category of modules that appears from this uh, equivariant factorization homology construction, but that means that this category in particular has lots of extra structure because it is coming from factorization homology. Um, so let me maybe try to draw a picture to see what kind of things we can do. Oh, in the meanwhile, if there's any questions about anything, this would be a good time to ask. Uh, what is the relation to double Planck algebra? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Let me answer it immediately. Okay, so what can we do? So, we take our punctured torus. Now, let us take, um, so that's T prime, and let us take some copies of D, maybe uh, let's take N of those, and let's take uh, two copies of D star. These clearly embed into T prime just by mapping in these disks in various places. And so what results is a functor from rep q g n times rep q k two times into this category of dqg modules. Um, okay. Now this functor, if we start moving around these disks corresponding to the quantum group, okay, these can move around freely. So there's various sort of isotopes between this functor and itself where we've moved around these points. Now if we just shrink these disks to points, okay, that's just the configuration space of points moving around in that, in that orbifold torus. And so by functoriality of the invariant, this functor naturally receives an action of the orbifold group of this torus. Now in particular, one thing that one might do is just choose things to plug in here. Okay? So you might choose V being the vector representation of the quantum group for each of these entries and take two characters here um, of uh, rep QK and then choose a D module here to home with. Okay, so we're going to home the image of this functor landing here with some sort of interesting uh, D module, which means we're going to be looking at the following uh, uh, product and copies of this vector representation, a character uh, new mapping into M. And maybe we were going to take dual here so that we can move this to the other side because that's actually how it appears in the literature. In any case, this vector space is receiving an action from Bn T 
mod z2. And for this particular choice of representations, this descends to the daha of type c check cn. So this was done by uh, David Jordan and Xiaoguan Ma in a paper uh, 10 years ago. And now this construction has naturally uh, reappeared um, in a more conceptual way, you can say. OK, let me uh, end there. Yep. But if you take other surfaces, have you computed what you get, say a sphere? Ah. So, yeah, that's a great question. So, what I've said so far is, of course, specific to framed things. And there's not a large supply of two-dimensional framed orbifold surfaces. So, one thing that you would have to do now is say, okay, what is the extra structure you need to go to an oriented version of this uh, TQ of T? And so, for the quantum group, it's quite clear. There's some ribbon element. For this um, quantum symmetric pair, actually that's still to be worked out, so that's work in progress. Now once we've pinned down that structure, which must be there, uh, then we can start computing uh, for general services what the invariants are. But if you look at sort of the work that well, David and his collaborators did, some of the key ingredients for building all services are DQG together with um, the annulus computation. Those two are done, so I think that gives us a lot of information about what to expect. In, in two dimensions, is there a reason you'd expect only the only sort of interesting um, group to, to, to choose in order to take um, the order following with respect to, to be Z mod 2 or the trivial group, or are there other uh -huh. what you expect if you took well, groups with too much representations? Ah, that's, no, that's a great question. Well, so, for example, Z mod 3, I think, would be actually very interesting itself. So there's n not yet a theory of quantum symmetric pairs for order 3 involution in the quantum group, but I and others expect there will be examples. If you look at D4 and the triality, this is hinting us that, that there will be a, an analog. Now, if you move completely away from, like, more general things, say you do D8, somehow the... Like, if I draw a picture of the type of um, strata that appear, you would get something like so, maybe. <clears throat> so what kind of the shame is, is that if I take an embedding of like the free quotient with all these copies, there's no way to move. So the embedding cannot move through these, um, uh, I guess, singular strata. And so somehow these isolated points, they have very kind of rich braided structures. And for something like D4, that will not be present. So I guess in that sense, for, for me, because I care about braid groups, these more like Z mods and Zs are, uh, are the most natural place to, uh, to look for invariants. Yeah. Um, what are the parameters of the DAHA here? Ah, that's a great question. Let's discuss that in the break when I pull up the paper. I, I don't remember exactly. So there's, um, so in choosing the symmetric pair, there's a choice of a parameter here. So there's one parameter. In choosing these characters, there's two parameters. There's the parameter Q of the quantum group. In fact, there might be even more for these. So it's already one, two, uh, three, four, five. Ah, so in fact, the characters come with two parameters, sorry. So it gives seven parameters that are somehow interdependent. We can, and recovers five um, parameters of the DAHA. I'll give you the specifics later. But so what's interesting here is that we see, well, there's more room to glue in, okay? So we could have glued in, glued in more um, symmetric pairs, which was really unobvious from the previous construction of Ma and Jordan. And so we're hoping that if you do this, maybe one can recover all the parameters of the, of the DAHA. But that's unclear at this point. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Tim. <laughs> <laughs>